The ASUS Zephyrus G14 is probably the most hyped up gaming laptop of 2020 so far. So let's get straight into the detailed review and show you everything you need to know about it. I've got one of the highest spec G14 configurations available. There's the new AMD Ryzen 9 4900HS processor, which has 8 cores and 16 threads at a 35W TDP. There's Nvidia RTX 2060 Max-Q graphics, 16GB of memory and dual channel, and the memory runs at DDR4-3200, one of the benefits of the new Ryzen platform. There's a 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD for storage, and a 14-inch 1080p 120Hz screen with FreeSync. For network connectivity, it's got Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5. However, there's no Ethernet here, so you'll need a dongle if you need that. The G14 is available in quite a few different configurations. You can find updated prices linked in the description. The G14 is available in either Moonlight White, which I have here, or Eclipse Grey, which I showed in my CES coverage. It's made out of magnesium alloy, and this includes the lid, interior, and bottom. Overall build quality felt good, and there were no sharp corners or edges anywhere. The G14 is available with and without the Anime Matrix display. Basically, the Anime Matrix display has 1215 LEDs on the lid which can be controlled in software with different effects, including custom animations or even email or battery notifications. Unfortunately, my review unit doesn't have it, so I haven't been able to test it out here. ASUS lists the weight of the G14 as 1.6 kilos, or 1.7 kilos with the Anime Matrix lid. I don't have the fancy lid, though mine was still close to 1.7 kilos. The 180W power brick is on the smaller side compared to others, and increases the total weight to 2.2 kilos. The dimensions are on the slimmer side, even for a 14-inch gaming laptop. The G14 with Anime Matrix lid is 2mm thicker than this, as those LEDs take up some space. The smaller footprint means the side screen bezels are just 8.5mm thick. The G14 is available with two screen options, a 1440p 60Hz IPS level panel, or the 1080p 120Hz IPS level panel, which is what my unit has. Honestly, at 14 inches, for gaming, I think the 1080p panel will be the way to go. 1440p at 14 inches will probably be less important for most users unless you really need that extra screen real estate. Both panel options do have FreeSync though, with no muck switch, and the FreeSync range for the 1080p panel was 48 to 120Hz. Both displays come calibrated from the factory and are Pantone validated. I've tested the 1080p panel with the Spyder 5 and got 96% of sRGB, 67% of NTSC, 73% of Adobe RGB, and 73% of DCI-P3. Fair results for a gaming laptop. Brightness was fair at 339 nits in the center at 100%, with a 910 to 1 contrast ratio. So quite nice results for a gaming laptop, but expect different results with the 1440p option. Backlight bleed appeared minimal to my eyes. In this worst case scenario, it was a little patchy towards the bottom right. No issues when viewing darker content, but this will vary between panels. There were no issues opening it up with one finger. It felt fairly well balanced. There was some screen flex when intentionally trying to move it. Despite the metallic build, the lid isn't too thick, but no issues during normal use. The Anime Matrix version might be a bit sturdier here as it's 2mm thicker. The hinges seem pretty sturdy, and they need to be, given they lift up the rear of the machine. The exterior of the hinges is plastic, but this covers the metal mechanism. When you open it up, the screen goes back 140 degrees and doing so raises the rear of the machine up 15mm. This has three advantages. It puts the keyboard on a slight incline, which is generally better for typing, the speakers underneath aren't pressed against the desk and sound better, and more air can get in to help with cooling. With the lid open, there are a couple of rubber feet on the back which come into contact with the desk. I didn't find it to be slippery on a flat surface like others with a similar design, but this may introduce chassis flex as it means there are less contact points between the base and the desk. The flex was only minor when pushing down hard, with a bit more right at the back in the center as expected, but absolutely no issues during normal use. I had no issues using the G14 on my lap. I need to really put the screen right back before the corners start to dig into my legs. It felt pretty comfortable for me anyway. Even with heavy stress tests running, it didn't feel too hot. While the middle was hot to the touch, but that area wasn't coming into contact with it sitting on my legs. Like many other recent laptops from ASUS, they've decided to leave the camera out, so you'll have to get an external camera if you need one. Although there's no camera, it's still got microphones, and this is what they sound like. 
The chiclet keyboard is missing some standard keys like home and page up and down, which might be annoying for some programmers and the like, but personally I never noticed any limitations during my own use. Oh, and no numpad either. It's got 1.7mm of key travel, I measured the actuation force of the letter keys at 58 grams, and overall I liked typing with it. Here's how it sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. The keyboard only has white backlighting, no fancy RGB here. All keys and secondary key functions are illuminated, however I thought the coverage was a bit patchy and suboptimal. The brightness can be adjusted between three levels or turned off completely with the function and arrow keys. There are four additional shortcut keys above the keyboard on the left, which let you adjust the volume, mute the microphone or open the ASUS Armory Crate software, which is the control panel for the system. The power button is over on the right and has a fingerprint scanner built in, which I found to work quite fast for unlocking the machine. It'll actually cache your fingerprint when you power it on and present it to Windows once the operating system has loaded to the login screen, which is kind of cool. It means you just press the power button once to turn it on and it'll use the fingerprint to log in automatically. If there are multiple user accounts, the user's fingerprint will determine which account gets logged into. The precision touchpad physically clicks down anywhere when pressed and it worked extremely well and was smooth to the touch. It was probably one of the best and most accurate feeling touchpads I've used. There are two front facing 0.7 watt tweeters towards either side just below the keyboard, and two 2.5 watt speakers on the bottom right down the front corners. I thought they sounded excellent, easily the best laptop speakers I've listened to in a long time. They were clear at louder volumes, had some bass, and were loud enough at maximum volume, and the latency mon results looked okay. Speaking of sounds, it makes this one by default on boot. You can disable this through the Armory Crate software or BIOS though. Fingerprints and dirt don't really show up on the silver finish. After a few days of heavy use, mine looked fine, though this will probably be more obvious with the black version. On the left from the back there's an air exhaust vent, the power input, HDMI 2.0b output which was not wired directly to the Nvidia GPU, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port with DisplayPort 1.4 support and power delivery, so up to two external 4K displays at once, followed by a 3.5mm audio combo jack which sounded fine with headphones. On the right from the front there's a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, another air exhaust vent on this side too, and Kensington lock. The back has air exhaust vents which are both angled down and up. The idea of the top vents is that air is exhausted directly up rather than onto the screen with the lid open. The front is all completely smooth, nothing here. Despite not having the anime matrix display, there are still holes in my lid. I stuck a pin inside to get a rough idea of how deep they are, and I'd guess less than a millimeter, but that may change with the LED lid. I can imagine dust and dirt getting into these holes after a while. Unfortunately I don't have mine long enough to check that out, otherwise the lid also has a shiny ROG pluck thing down the bottom corner. Underneath just has some holes for air intake towards the back half. The bottom panel can be removed very easily by taking out 14 Phillips head screws. The four screws down the front are shorter than the rest, and the screw down the front right corner doesn't fully come out. It pushes the panel up to aid opening. The inside of the bottom panel appears to have a metal heat shield, though as we saw, the bottom can get quite warm in the center under heavy load. Once inside, we've got the battery down the bottom, single M.2 slot for storage on the left, and single memory slot just right of the center. I've got an 8GB stick installed in the single SODIMM slot, so my G14 has 8GB of DDR4-3200 memory soldered to the motherboard which cannot be upgraded. Wi-Fi also appears to be soldered to the board. The G14 sells with up to 32 gig, which means there's an option with 16 gig soldered to the board. So make sure you buy with this in mind as you can't upgrade later. You'll need a single stick installed to take advantage of dual channel. The M.2 slot appears to support four lanes of PCIe according to hardware info. The G14 is powered by a 76 watt hour battery. I've tested it with the screen brightness at 50%, background apps disabled, and keyboard lighting off. While just watching YouTube videos, it lasted for 6 hours and 10 minutes with the screen set to 120Hz and Optimus enabled. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30fps, the battery lasted for an hour and 36 minutes. 
At this point, the frame rate dipped to 13 FPS and was no longer playable. However, it still had 10% charge remaining and lasted for an hour and 49 minutes if you include this slower rate. The G14 also supports Type-C charging with the left port, not the right one though, so you can carry a smaller charger or battery bank with you to support lower powered tasks. Asus say a 65 watt Type-C charger will charge from 0 to 60% in 60 minutes, or a full charge in 176 minutes. So slower than using the 180 watt power brick, but good to have as an option if you don't need max performance. It's perfect for light work. Now let's find out how hot the G14 gets and see if this causes any issues to performance. The ASUS Armory Crate software lets you select different performance modes, which from lowest to highest are silent, performance, and turbo. Turbo mode overclocks the GPU core by 100MHz and GPU memory by 120MHz. The manual option on the end lets you push this GPU overclock further, and also modify fan speed. When I test the manual option in the upcoming graphs, I've left the overclock at stock but boosted the fans to maximum. There are no fan curves for customizing. All you can do is control either the CPU or GPU fan independently between different percentage levels. Unfortunately at this time, there's no undervolting support for Ryzen 4000. At least none of the options in the software or BIOS indicated that this was possible. Here's a quick look through the BIOS which you can get into by pressing F2 during boot. Inside there are 5 heat pipes in total, with 3 shared between the processor and graphics, along with 2 self-cleaning fans. Air comes in from the bottom, possibly through the keyboard too, and is exhausted out the left and right rear corners and out the back. Thermals were tested with a 21 degrees Celsius ambient room temperature. Idle results down the bottom were fine. Worst case stress tests were done with the ADA64 CPU stress test with CPU only checked and the Heaven benchmark at max settings at the same time. And gaming was tested with Watch Dogs 2 as I find it to use a good combination of processor and graphics. Starting with the stress tests, in silent mode the GPU was thermal throttling, but that's just because this mode limits the fan speed as you'll hear later. Stepping up to performance mode removed the thermal throttle on the GPU and there was no change to the CPU temperature. The CPU gets hotter with turbo mode enabled, however we can bring it back down by setting the fan to maximum speed. And if you're willing to use a cooling pad, we're able to get a nice 10 degree reduction. The gaming results follow a similar pattern, but were in general a little cooler when compared to those worst case stress tests. These are the clock speeds for the same tests. The silent results were interesting. In the stress test, the GPU was thermal throttling, so the CPU was able to boost up higher. Then when actually playing a game, we see the GPU running higher as thermals weren't an issue in this specific title. There's a fair difference in CPU clock speeds between performance and turbo modes. Based on the temperature results, this mode may cap out at 90 degrees. It's hard to say as hardware info doesn't appear to be updated yet to report CPU thermal throttling. Performance continues to improve as we improve the cooling though. These speeds look pretty good. Almost 4.1 GHz on all 8 cores best case in this game. These are the average power levels reached during these same tests. Silent mode seems to primarily cap the CPU power limit to 15 watts. And interestingly, the GPU power levels aren't all that much below the 65 watt limit of the RTX 2060 Max-Q. So gaming at silent may be possible, we'll look next. Otherwise we can see the 4900HS is able to run at its 35 watt power limit just by enabling turbo mode which is great to see. It's even close to full power in this worst case stress test prior to improving cooling. I've tested Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the game's benchmark tool to test these different performance modes and see what differences they actually make. Silent was still around 60 FPS on average, so gaming with quieter fans is possible. Meanwhile we were able to get small improvements by improving the cooling in turbo mode. In CPU heavier titles, like Watch Dogs 2 during the previous testing, it was a bit laggy and silent though. For GPU focused games though, as we saw, the GPU still performs quite well. I attempted to run the stress tests with the lid closed, however the laptop would put itself to sleep after a few minutes like this when the CPU got to around 95.6 degrees. So I guess it gets too hot and goes to sleep rather than a hard shut off. The sleep reason in the event viewer just notes the reason as application API with no further details. Now let's take a look at CPU only performance, so when the discrete 2060 Max-Q graphics are idle. I've run the A to 64 CPU stress test with the 4 default options checked, and we can see that outside of silent mode there's not too much of a change to clock speeds. However things do get better as cooling improves. When we look at the temperatures though, they were nowhere near thermal throttling, so it appears that lower temperatures slightly boost performance. Which is a little odd, given on average they were all sitting at the 35 watt power limit during this test. In a CPU only workload like Cinebench, the 4900HS kills it. 
There was less of an improvement with better cooling observed in this workload compared to the prior tests with the GPU active. It's worth remembering these are averages over 5 runs. We can see how results lower over time between these tests once the boost period ends. Even by the time it's no longer boosting and settles at 35 watts, the performance is still great. I've also compared the Cinebench results from the G14 with other 8-core laptops I've tested. Honestly, the results are quite impressive when we remember those other i9 laptops are running with far higher power limits and are all much thicker machines. 17-inch ones in most cases. 3000 points is best case for the i7-9750H, and the Ryzen 9 is around 1000 points faster. I've got the best Ryzen 7 3750H from last gen down the bottom, just to give you an idea of how far they've come. Here's a screenshot of what the package power looks like over time with Blender running. We can see it's running around 60 watts for the first few minutes, then after a while it eventually drops down to the sustained 35 watt limit. So you can actually get some nice performance out of the 4900HS at those higher limits. As we just saw, the temperatures of the CPU weren't that hot, at least compared to when gaming with an active GPU load at the same time. So I think if they wanted to, they could boost it for longer. And maybe we'll see this in other Ryzen 4000 laptops. If you want to see how the 4900HS compares with other processors like Intel's 8-core 9880H, check out Tim's video on the Hardware Unboxed channel linked in the description. Here's how it looks in the areas where you'll actually touch. At idle, it was below the typical 30 degrees Celsius I usually see in most laptops. With the stress tests going in silent mode, it's on the warmer side with some of the keys in the middle feeling hot, which is expected given the fans are quiet. Stepping up to performance mode and it's a little cooler now while also performing better as the fan speed increases. Turbo mode was similar, maybe a degree or two cooler in the hotspots, with WASD still cool as air must be blowing through. With manual mode, so the fan at maximum speed, it's a little cooler again. Worst case, right up the back can get hot to the touch, but you don't really need to touch there. Let's have a listen to how loud the fans get during these same tests. At idle it was quiet, however the fan was making an odd sort of sound, not sure if it's just my unit. In silent mode it's still on the quieter side, and as we saw earlier, playing GPU bound games was still possible like this. Performance was a bit louder still, granted quieter when compared to most other gaming laptops I've tested, and turbo mode was still under 50 decibels, then maximum was just a little louder still. Overall I thought the thermals were alright. Yeah, it can get hot when you max it out in turbo mode before the fan speed increases, however you've got the option of running the fans faster to improve results. But if you want to take things to the next level, a cooling pad helps quite a bit here. Just don't forget this is a thinner 14-inch machine with an 8-core processor inside. Next, let's find out how well the G14 performs in games. I've tested with turbo mode enabled for best results, which as a reminder overclocks the graphics a bit. In Battlefield 5, I've got the G14 highlighted in red near similarly specced machines. Well, kind of. It's hard to compare apples to apples here, as I believe this is the first gaming laptop to actually feature NVIDIA RTX 2060 Max-Q graphics or at the very least, is the first I've been able to get my hands on. Given it runs with a 65 watt limit, it looks like the 80 watt 1660 Ti systems can outperform it. It's real close to the SCAR 2 with non-RTX 2060 though, so that's interesting. And average FPS is similar to the Y540 with i7 and 1660 Ti, though the 1% low from the 4900HS was lower compared to the Intel i7 machines. Granted, it was better than AMD's previous 3750H based laptops. These are the results from Far Cry 5 with ultra settings in the built in benchmark. This time, the 1% low performance was looking pretty good with the 4900HS. But again, it seems that average FPS is lower when compared to higher wattage graphics options. It's really hard to fairly compare the 4900HS due to the 2060 Max Q. So we'll have to wait until I get some other laptops that feature that CPU but with different graphics to do a fair comparison. These are the results from Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the built-in benchmark at highest settings. In this test, the frame rate was closer to those more powerful 1660Ti laptops, which was interesting. So fair results from the G14 here given the lower powered 65 watt GPU. I'll post my usual video showing gaming performance in 20 games at all setting levels tomorrow, so make sure you're subscribed for that.
we'll check out how well the Vega graphics perform in an upcoming video too. I'll also note that I had no issues at all in terms of stability at any point. I think the issue with other Ryzen based laptops generally stems from Radeon driver issues. So the Ryzen processor with Nvidia graphics here worked flawlessly. I've used Adobe Premiere to export one of my laptop review videos at 4K. Compared to the old 3750H machines up the top, the G14 is completing half as fast. Which kind of makes sense as the 4900HS does have double the core count. In this particular test though, it's not quite as fast as many of the Intel options as those make use of QuickSync here. In terms of Linux support, I was able to boot into Ubuntu 19.10 with safe graphics mode, and the touchpad, sound, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth worked fine. The keyboard was okay too, minus the lighting which I couldn't enable, so it needs software to function. Now for the benchmarking tools. I've tested Heaven, Valley and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy and Port Royal from 3 Mark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. Here are the results from SpecViewPerf should you want to compare the results against other machines in more professional 3D workloads. I've used Crystal Diskmark to test the storage, and the 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD was performing alright. Some material online seems to indicate that it's a PCIe 3.0 2 lane slot. However the SSD has 4 lane support and hardware info seem to indicate 4 lane support too. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices will change over time. At the time of recording prior to launch, I don't actually have too much information. The G14 with same specs I've tested here is listed at $1450 US dollars at Best Buy in the US. Here in Australia, we were told it would go for about $2500 Australian dollars. And if you convert AUD to USD and remove our tax, it ends up being very similar to the Best Buy listing. Which if accurate, seems like good value for this level of CPU performance. If you're just after best gaming performance though, you could spend less on an 80 watt GTX 1660 Ti based laptop. However it will also be larger, and to be fair, the 65 watt 2060 Max-Q could still handle any game I threw at it. But yeah, you're paying a premium for the smaller G14 as expected. With all of that in mind, let's conclude by looking at the good and bad aspects of the G14 gaming laptop. I haven't tested all that many 14 inch gaming laptops. It's a much less common size, probably due to the difficulties involved with getting good specs in a smaller area. But ASUS have pulled it off with the G14. The new Ryzen 9 4900HS wasn't too far behind other Intel based i9 systems that also have 8 core 16 thread processors. Especially when you consider all the Intel machines are physically larger, but also run well above the 35 watts of the Ryzen chip. The GPU performance was alright. Again, especially once we take the 14 inch form factor into consideration. The smaller size makes it quite portable, and this is helped out by the smaller than normal power brick. Type C charging is also an option for lower power drawing tasks if you need something more portable. This is a nice to have feature that I wish others would start adding. Battery life was pretty decent though given the size. Results were above average compared to many others. It's great that we get FreeSync, and that 1440p is an option for those that want it. Otherwise the 1080p 120Hz panel that I've tested here is a better option for gamers. And I thought the colours, brightness and contrast were pretty decent. The build quality was above average considering the smaller size. The entire thing is magnesium alloy with a clean finish. There was some flex to it due to the lift design, however it wasn't an issue during normal use. And the advantages this provides, such as improved cooling, an incline for typing, and some of the best laptop speakers I've ever heard seems to make it worthwhile. The I.O. was pretty fair for a smaller machine, though no Thunderbolt or Ethernet here. It was easy to get inside. The single memory slot was a little disappointing, but it's probably a space constraint to fit too. At least it still runs in dual channel. You'll just have to make sure you buy it so that the soldered memory is enough going into the future. I also didn't really like the patchy backlighting of the keyboard. It just wasn't very evenly lit. Not having a camera may also be a limit for some, so you'll need to look into an external one if you need it. The G14 can get hotter than I'm sure many of you were expecting. However, I have no issues with this personally. If a laptop has thermal headroom available, you can bet it's going to get used to boost performance. Just remember, we do have an 8 core processor with decent graphics in a smaller chassis here. If you want to run it cooler or quieter, you've got the option of doing so by adjusting the fan speed. Compared to most other laptops, the fan noise was quieter until you max it out. All things considered, I think the G14 is offering impressive levels of performance in a smaller package. Especially for those who need raw CPU power. It's able to hang with other thicker and larger machines with the more power hungry i9. Overall there's a lot to like here with not too many downsides. 
I can see why so many of you just couldn't wait for this review. Let me know what you thought about the ASUS Zephyrus G14 gaming laptop down in the comments, or if you've got questions on anything I missed. I'm looking forward to testing more Ryzen 4000 laptops in the future, so if you're new to the channel consider getting subscribed for future laptop reviews and tech videos like this one. There's a lot more new stuff on the way.